Kind Heavenly Father, you are so faithful and so wonderful. And we are so honored that you are here today in our midst. Lord, I pray that as we explore this topic this morning, you would be glorified, you would be magnified. God and your people would be electrified. And that they would go out from this room, from this building, excited about you and the things that you have called us to do here on planet Earth. Lord, we thank you for the weather. We thank you for the warmth. We ask that you continue it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, like I said, we're going to get into another one of our What's the Big Deal sermons. How many had a cup of coffee today when you walked in? All right, that's a lot of coffee. How many noticed on the back wall when you were getting your cup of coffee, there's some nice decals, right? And it says, a place of healing, transformation, and mission. How many know what that stands for? What that is? Here at Counterfort Alliance Church, that is our vision. That's our statement. That we want to be a place of healing, transformation, and mission. And that's exciting because we look around and we see all kinds of broken people that need healed. Amen? How many of you were once broken people that needed healed? Two arms and a leg, right? And then, and then the next part of it is transformation. And once we become healed, often we look in the mirror and we're not exactly... In, in, not the physical mirror, but the spiritual mirror, we look and we're not exactly happy with where we are in our walk with Christ. And so transformation needs to take place. How many know that the Bible says, be transformed, right? So we want to be transformed. So that's good. So we got, we got the healing and we got the transformation. But then this, this, this last pesky little piece with the fire on top of it, mission. What does that mean? What is mission? You know, so... What is the big deal with mission? You know, a lot of times in our minds we think mission like this guy right here, right? This is this 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 lone American or English guy in the jungle, and he's surrounded. I, I had to crop the picture because there was very little clothing on those women and I didn't realize that and I was like whoa okay but that's 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 in our minds that's a lot of times what, what mission looks like right there's there's it's the missionaries it's it's those people doing that maybe it's the skid row mission but you know that, that's not tower sport it's not like we have skid row out behind the grocery store I mean there might be I don't know I haven't seen it but you know that's that's kind of where we are and, and then there's mission statements Maybe, maybe you work somewhere where there's a mission statement to go above and beyond. Our customers are our family, right? That kind of a thing. And then, and then some of us have a personal mission statement. I will never be like my father. If my mother ever comes out of my mouth, I'm not going to talk again for the rest of my life, right? And then, and, but but those, those tend not to happen because if you know my dad, I'm an awful lot like him. And, and, and actually, I've heard my mother come out of, out of my mouth. And, and it's, it's, it's disconcerting at, at, at best sometimes. But, but we have our personal mission statements. That's not what I'm talking about. Maybe some of you were, were around in the, in, in, in the 60s. And there was a TV show. And it was called Mission Impossible. Right? And it started with a match. And just from one, the, the striking of one match, an hour-long suspenseful <gasps> took place, right? And then, and then in, in, in the 80s and, or 90s or whenever it was, Tom Cruise never ages, so I don't know exactly how old. <laughs> they, they, they did some movies about the Mission Impossible, right? But that, that, that's not what I'm talking about. Also, some, some of our older saints may remember there was a mission to the moon, right? And the whole country gathered around, and, and we were going to send men to the moon. And, and the next generation, my children's generation, they're planning a mission to Mars, which was completely inconceivable 50 years ago. But now they're actually planning it. They're taking applications and resumes for these people to get on a spaceship and go to Mars. That's crazy. 
But that's not the kind of mission I'm talking about, okay? What I'm talking about is the biblical mission. All right? So those of you who are old school and you have the King James Version, I'm sorry, some of us newer folks, okay, we have the New International Version. Did you know that the word mission is in the NIV nine times? That's not very many times, right? If, you, if you're old school and you walked in with, with the 1611 version of the King James Bible today, it's not in there. You're not going to find the word mission in, in the King James. So why is it such a big deal? If it's only mentioned nine times in, in one translation, and it's not mentioned at all in the translation that Jesus spoke in, right? Everybody knows, right, Jesus taught King, J, King James English. If, if it's not mentioned at all there, then really, what is the big deal with mission? You know, and, and so, in the Bible, where the New International Version has translated the word mission, the King James had things like, kept the charge, gone the way, on a journey. I like this one, so I, I highlighted the whole thing. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him. It was a mission. Okay, David also had a business, the business that he had to do for the king. Okay, so those words were translated mission in the NIV. But really, is that what we mean in our vision statement? You know, it's, it's talking about a specific task. Is that what we mean when you see the fire on the back wall? Is that what we're talking about here at College Bowl Alliance Church? Is it a specific task? Well, yes and no, but not specifically. That's not exactly. You know, a ministry... The definition, then, that I've found, that I've chosen, is a specific task with which a person or a group is charged. We all bought that. That's good. But the second one, a calling or vocation. That's what I want to focus on today. So, if you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25... If you don't have your Bibles, you can look at the screen. That's all it's going to say. But you have to have faith that the pastor can read English, so we're going to give it a shot. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these my brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, the goats, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Yikes. This is, this, is, this is not good, okay? For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they said... Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick in prison? And when was it that we did not help you? And he said, I tell you the truth. Whoever, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. So, mission. We have hungry, thirsty, strangers, refugees, naked, sick, prisoners. And Jesus says, if you are one of mine, you reach out to these. That's hard. Man, it's a lot easier to come to church where 
Maybe if you're hungry, it's because you chose not to eat. Maybe if you're thirsty. We just talked about the coffee bar. There's coffee right there. How many strangers? There might be a couple, but we greet you at the door and we ask you to come in and we fellowship with you. So you're only a stranger once and then after that, your family. Right? Nobody's naked. I looked. We're good today. Everybody wore clothes to church. This is good. Nobody's sick. If you're sick, you usually don't come to church. And obviously, if you're here, you're not in prison. So it's easy for us to be, man, I can be all mission-minded here. I can be mission-minded because you guys don't fit that bill. You're my brothers. You're my sisters. It's easy to be mission-minded with you guys because it's awesome. Now, it's a little more difficult when we're walking downtown and that guy, you all know who that guy is, right? Wants to strike up a conversation with you. Right? And he's hungry. And he's thirsty. He's not a stranger, but you're not going to let him in. You wish he was naked because maybe his clothes wouldn't smell so bad. Okay? He's probably sick. He's got something wrong with him. And you know he was he did time. It's hard to be it's hard to be missional minded then. Okay? So that's the kind of mission I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of mission that stretches us and makes us uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable, isn't it? It got quiet in here all at once. Because you're all squirming. I'm squirming too. It's uncomfortable to be the hands and feet of Jesus out there. It's uncomfortable to be the hands and feet of Jesus in your workplace. It's uncomfortable to be the hands and feet of Jesus where you're not comfortable. So, what is the big deal about mission? Now that I've guilted you a little bit, and that was not my intention. What is the big deal about mission? Why is, it, why is being the hands and feet of Jesus everywhere we go such a big deal? Really, what's, why? Talk about Jesus. Brad Sickler is a regional team leader in our district down in the southeast region of our district. And he gave us, we, we have, we get together once a month, a bunch of us Alliance pastors get together and we get coached. We have a coaching cluster. And a couple months ago, no, it was last month. Brad actually, after I had this sermon series all planned out, he brought in some things about mission. And it was really good. So I decided I was going to use that today. So I, Brad, if you're watching, thank you. Good stuff. Okay, a purpose and a mission are two different things. How many know that a purpose, if something has, is created and it has a purpose, that purpose never stops, right? A tire is created and its purpose is to be on something and go around and around and around and around and around. That's its purpose. Its purpose never stops. That's what a tire does. Its mission might be to be on the front of my car. Its mission probably is only going to last about 35 or 40,000 miles the way I drive. And then its mission is completed, but it never stops. Very similarly, we as believers, as people, have a purpose and a mission. They are not the same. So let's, ex let's explore, if you will, for just a minute, in Scripture, the person that we all are trying to be more like, Jesus. What was Jesus' purpose? Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that. We'll get there. <laughs> Jesus' purpose is actually to do the will of the Father. He said in John chapter 4, how many remember John chapter 4, the woman at the well, right? Jesus is in Samaria. The boys go into town to get ha hamburgers and hot dogs. They come back and Jesus is not eating. And they're like, did somebody already bring the Lord something to eat? And Jesus in John 4, 34 says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. 
His food, the very thing that drove Jesus, was to do the will of the Father. John chapter 6, Jesus is praying and He says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. So why did Jesus come from heaven? To do the will of the Father. That was His purpose. Okay? So what was Jesus' mission, John? To seek and save the lost. Last week, Pastor Sam preached on Zacchaeus. The very end of that story, Jesus says in, Zac in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That was Jesus' mission. Now you're looking at me like a calf and looks at a new gate. Did you know that ten days before Pentecost, Jesus took a cloud and went back to heaven, right? How many lost has Jesus sought and saved since that day? He hasn't. He's in heaven making intercession for us. That's what my Bible says. So, what did he say just before he left? He gave us a mission to do. Right? So we're going to get there. So, our purpose as the church, as a body of believers, as the bride of Christ, we have the same purpose as Christ. So what does that look like to do the will of the Father as the church? First of all, our purpose is worship. A couple weeks ago I preached a sermon on worship and how it is honoring God in everything that we do. Deuteronomy 6.5 says, Love the Lord your God with half your heart, some of your mind, and a little bit of your strength. Right? No. All of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your strength. This is, no, this is not a... I've got to be careful. I'm going to preach the message for three weeks from now. This is not a partial thing. This is an all-in walk that we have. All our heart is all our heart. You can't reserve part of it and still be fulfilling your purpose. All our mind is all our mind. You can't reserve part of it and fulfill your purpose. Okay? So Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So it doesn't matter what you do. Do everything to honor Christ. I, it, it doesn't matter if you are carrying a bag of mail and putting letters in mailboxes. Do it to honor Christ. It doesn't matter if you're stacking lumber. Do it to honor Christ. It doesn't matter if you're driving a truck or teaching kids or preparing sermons. Do it to honor Christ. And that is worship. That is part one of what the church, our purpose is. Okay? The second thing. Our purpose is for edification. Edification literally means to build up. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11 says, Encourage one another and build each other up. That's our job. If I see you in the grocery store and it looks like somebody stepped on your kitty and you're just sad. Oh, my job is to build you up. If you see me at sheets and it looks like I've been put through the ringer, your job is to build me up. We are to build up each other. That's our job. That's our purpose. That's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to, we exist to edify one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13 says, that Jesus, as the head of the church, gave some apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists to build up his body. My job as your pastor 
is to build you up. If you leave feeling more defeated than you did when you walked through the door, I failed. If that happens, please shoot me an email. Let me know. We'll get together. It's not my plan. My plan is to build you up. When you walk into church, you should feel like you know you're going to be ministered to by the Holy Spirit. You should feel built up, recharged, okay, edified. That's one of the things that we need to do as the body of Christ. The third thing is fellowship. We all like fellowship. Evangelicals especially like fellowship because it usually means food. We have fellowship dinners and fellowship breakfasts and fellowship prayers. And, and, and what's the common denominator? There's food. We like fellowship. But fellowship actually means sharing in a relationship. Husbands and wives, your relationship is an example of fellowship. You should, in a healthy marriage, be able to communicate back and forth and resolve some things. That's fellowship. Now, we have fellowship with God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 says, Our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Christ Jesus. We share a relationship with Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth. We have that fellowship with Him. And with His Son, Christ Jesus. Because Jesus paid the price and bought each one of us and made us His own. That sounds like a pretty good relationship. I want to be part of that. Then, we also have fellowship with other believers. And it's not always about food. Although oftentimes it ends up that way because we tend to, as humans, become intimate with those people we share food with. And that's what we need to be. We need to be able to have that intimate relationship with other believers. That's what God has called us to do. Acts chapter 4. That's not right. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Says that they, are to, that they met together and broke bread and fellowship. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Don't neglect the meeting together as some are doing. That's talking about fellowship. That's talking about sharing relationship. And it's not always fun. Sometimes it's because we need to cry on each other's shoulder. That's not joyful, is it? But it's a necessary part of that fellowship. It's a necessary part of that sharing relationship. Is to be open and transparent one with another. That's fellowship. And then the fourth part of our purpose as a church is outreach and evangelism. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16. Let's flip over three or four pages from where we were. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. If all authority has been given to Jesus, how much is left? So who has all the authority? Thank you. It's another sermon I'm getting ready for. So I'm, I'm liking this. Jesus then says, Therefore, because all authority is given to me, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey Everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus told us how to do outreach and evangelism, right? Go and make disciples. It seems pretty cut and dry. I wish it was that cut and dry. The command is, the, com the, the commissioning is, but the, the getting there is a little more difficult. So that was our, our purpose as the church. But what is our mission? Well, which one of those four will we not be doing when we get to heaven? We will be fellowshipping. We will be worshiping. We will be edifying. 
But there won't be any outreach in heaven. It's not like heaven has a tent meeting. Billy Graham's not preaching a salvation message on the streets of gold, right? You don't get there if you're not saved. There's no outreach. There's no evangelism going on in heaven. So if there's none of that happening there, how much more important do you think maybe it is that we do it here? If it's part of our purpose, if it's part of the reason that we exist, but it's something that we are not going to do for eternity, maybe we really ought to pay some attention to it. That is because it's our mission. The church's mission is outreach and evangelism. Now, it's good to fellowship. It's good. It's great to worship. Edification is necessary. But it's not our mission. Our mission is outreach. Our mission is evangelism. Well, that's great, Pastor Kevin. That's, that's awesome. But how do we do it? I'm glad you asked. First, we need to grow our vision. Way too often, the body of Christ has had tunnel vision. When somebody walks through the door, we'll pounce on them like vultures. Welcome, welcome, have a cup of coffee. It's so good to see you in the house of God. But our vision stops at the door. And then we, we, we neglect to see those people who may be hurting outside. So well, the first step we need to do is to grow our vision. We need to be able to look outward. We need to be able to take those blinders off. Use our peripheral vision to maybe see those who are in the periphery. Then we need to open our heart. This one's hard. Because sometimes those people in the periphery are hard to love. It's awful hard to put your arm around somebody and love on them when you know they're so drunk they're not going to remember it. It's really, really difficult when the Lord says, pay for this person's groceries, gas, light bill, whatever. And you know, you know that because they didn't have to pay that bill, they're going to use that money to go do something that, you were, that you're not in favor of. It's difficult to open your heart and allow God to break your heart for what breaks His. Because His heart's broken an awful lot. looking and seeing what's going on on his created earth. We need to learn to make an effort to look beyond our regular I put regular in quotation marks. We need to make an effort. It's not easy. So because it's not easy we don't do it. It's not easy so we need to make an effort. We need to be intentional. And I know we've used that word, we've beaten that word intentional into the dirt, pulled it up and beat it again. Intentionality, intentionality, intentionality. But we do because you have to. It's important. <laughs> intentionality is important. So yeah, I'm gonna beat it up, I'm gonna beat on that word again. We need to be intentional about looking out. Sometimes it means driving around the block a second time because there was somebody standing there that you felt you were supposed to stop and talk to and you didn't. So instead of just going on your merry way, make three left-hand turns and try again, man. The other day I was leaving and the landscapers were here. They were mowing out across the road. The conservation district came and planted 198 shrubs for us out across the, on the other side of the river. And I wanted to make sure that this guy on, on the lawnmower didn't run over 192 of the 198 shrubs. So I stopped and went to talk to him, just say, hey man, just 18 inches away from the flags. 
That was, the, that was my intention. He shut off his law, Lord. And he said, do you go to church here? Well, yeah. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> he said, well, I have a question for you. And he asked me a question I did not expect to come from this guy that's sitting on a lawn tractor. And as he's asking me this question, in the back of my head I'm going, oh, Jesus, help. And the Holy Spirit gave me an answer. And he was like, oh, wow. Well, maybe, I haven't been to church in a long time. I said, well, I don't only go there, I'm the pastor. So here, why don't you come to church on Sunday? Oh, wow, it would be great. It was not a normal, comfortable thing for me. I had to look beyond my regular. My regular would have been like, hey, dude, don't run over the shrubs. Got back in my car and left. But something made me stay. And as I got back in, the, in my car and finally drove away after about 20 minutes, I think he gets paid by the hour, so he was fine. I said, thank you, Lord. And in that process, he, he asked for my number. I gave him my number. He sent me a text. I sent him a text. I invited him to church again. He's not here this morning, but that's okay. I did what I was supposed to do. I looked beyond my regular. Challenge you to do the same. Then we need to ask for opportunities to be his hands and feet. Be careful when you do this, because he will take you up on it. Jesus, make me your hands and feet at work, and you will be surprised what conversations are going to transpire at lunchtime. Because somebody that you work with is hurt and sees a light in you. And they're just waiting for that opportunity. And when we ask, he will answer. Hang on to your hats. Because when God starts moving, it's big. So when we start asking for those opportunities, and people start realizing that we have an answer to a question they're asking, they're going to want to know where we got that answer. And you're going to say, it's from the Lord. Well, what about, what do you mean by the Lord? Who's the Lord? Well, it's Jesus. Well, okay, I've, I, I know about Jesus because I talk about him every time I hit my hand with a hammer. And, right? And, and then you'll have an opportunity to witness. And then they're going to say, well, how do I learn more about him? And you're going to be like, well, we got this really awesome pastor in my church, and he talks about him all the time. <laughs> do you like that? <laughs> and, and you're going to ask him, well, why don't you come to church on Sunday? And then y'all are going to have to start coming at 945 because you're not going to find a seat. Okay, some people bought that, some people didn't. You're going to have to start coming at 945 because it's going to be full. Because you ask for God to give you an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's that simple. We need to keep an open mind. How many know, lots of times, we ask God to move this way. Alright Lord, here's a box, move inside this box. Show up and show off right inside this little box I've made for you, Lord. Right? And then when he does, we're like, oh, look, God is powerful. God is awesome. And, and meanwhile, God's going, you put me in a domino. I'm God. I'm the God of the universe. My challenge for you is to keep an open mind. Allow that just maybe that person that you are intimidated by is smaller than Jesus. They are. And maybe that in your mind you're saying there's no possible way I could do whatever it is that God's called you to do. Keep an open mind. He's big. You know every time they create a new telescope and they find the end of the universe? Every time they say, oh, it keeps growing. Do you think? They're never going to be able to find the end of it. I hate to tell them. They're, they're wasting billions and billions of taxpayer dollars trying to find the end of the... It's not there. It blows our mind. 
Our human brains can't comprehend the vastness of God Almighty. They're never going to find it. And we, as his followers, often limit him in our thoughts, in our minds. Well, God, you might have done that for Peter, James, and John, but you can't do it for us. Yeah, we heard about the dead being raised in, in China, but we're just, we're just little old Calvary's poor. We heard about the miraculous happening here, but it's just us. Get over yourselves. He's God. If you have an open mind and if you fully believe, He wants to show up and show off in a way so much bigger than the little box that we have put Him in. I keep saying you and I'm preaching to myself. We put Him in such a tiny little box. Because our minds are so small. So we need to keep an open mind. And then when we do that, we need to expect God to move. Oftentimes, I have prayed for somebody and not expected God to do what I've asked Him to do. I'm learning. I'm getting better. I don't do that near as often. But man, Lord, I need you to X, Y, Z. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, yeah, but, but really you won't. So. And then he's like, oh, well, if you don't believe. Right? We don't expect him to move. So he doesn't. But if we start approaching our prayer life and our asking him, and our disciple making with an expectation that he wants to and he's going to move, then it'll be 9.30 when you have to get here. Because the 9.45 people are going to be late. Because God wants to move. And God wants to do and wants to and wants to and wants to, but we need to learn to expect him to. And when that happens, when we have... A go-make attitude about our mission, we are going to go and we're going to make. You see, the Holy Spirit works in ways that we'll never comprehend. Remember what Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. He never said that we were going to clean them up. We're not the canter. We're the fishermen. It's not up to us to get them right. It's not up to us to have these wonderful, spirit-filled, mature Christians that we're bringing into church. No. Our mission is to find the hurt and the broken and the smelly. Maybe the drunk and the high and the homeless and bring them into the church and allow the Holy Spirit to do what he does he's big, he's been doing it a long time he's really, really good at it a whole lot better than we can be military officers are trained and then given a commission people don't sign up for the Air Force And day one, have a commission. They have to go through a process. They have to go through some training. They have to go through some, if you would, disciple making before they're given a commission. So today, I want you to see the commission that you have been given. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is our mission. That is our commission. And that is the big deal about missions. Let's pray. Lord, I am honored that your spirit has been here and has been moving in this time of teaching. 
Lord, I pray that you would ignite a passion for mission here in our local church. Lord, that it would not just be a cute saying on the wall and it wouldn't be just a mantra that we repeat, but God, that it would become a lifestyle. Lord, that we would continue to be the salt and the light in the areas that you have called us to serve in. Lord, that we would grasp that plow and not turn back, but Lord, that we would drive forward in our mission of making disciples for you. Lord, our goal is to lift you high and to proclaim your name all around our community, all around our county, all around our state, our country, Lord, and, and even this globe. Lord, I believe that you have called Calvary Alliance Church to have a footprint in missions. Lord, and we are today asking you to ignite this passion in each of us for the lost. Lord, you said that you came to seek and save the lost. Lord, let us make that our personal mission to seek and to save those that are lost because lost people matter to you. Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the courage that the Holy Spirit gives us. And I thank you for those opportunities that you're going to put in our path, Lord, to speak truth and to be your hands and feet. When you do, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory because it is all about you. And it's in Jesus' strong name I pray. Amen.